Hello everyone, my name is Eric Limaker. I'm currently a postdoc working at Princeton University under the supervision of Dr. Marcus Haltmark and Dr. Alexander Smits. On this particular project, I've also been working with the other postdoc in the lab, Dr. Lu Young Ding, and Alexander Piquet, who's a PhD student in the lab. And the topic I'm looking at today is how we might use near-wake data behind an operating turbine to estimate the thrust on that turbine. And in particular, we'll be using stereo PIV. With regards to motivation, one application of this work would be improvements to blade element momentum theory. Typically, blade element momentum theory depends on assumptions about what's going on in the far wake, but ultimately the goal is to relate thrust to what's going on at or near the blades. So if we can skip that step of assumption and directly relate near wake data to the thrust, that might be an improvement to the rigor of that theory. I'm also interested sort of more long term in considering possibilities for in situ turbine diagnostics. So if we had some point measurements or some field measurements of velocity just behind a turbine, could we estimate with reasonable accuracy the loads on the blades, even perhaps the sectional loads? And then could we compare that information to the predicted loads based on our, our design models? So that could be that could be useful. Theoretically, the approach that I've taken is to use vortical impulse theory, which is an alternative to the standard momentum control volume control volume analysis. It's simply an equivalent but different expression of the conservation of linear momentum. And the key difference between the two is that the standard approach involves velocity and pressure to express the force, whereas the vortical impulse method requires information about velocity and vorticity. This is useful because it's easier to make physical arguments about what the vorticity field is doing than to argue about what the pressure field is doing directly behind the blades. So what is vortical impulse? For those of you who aren't familiar, I'll give you just a very brief overview. We get to it by actually by starting from the standard momentum control volume analysis and then through the application of various vector calculus identities and the substitution of the Navier-Stokes equation, we come to what we call the impulse formulation. And in my opinion, the best source for this derivation would be NOCA's 1997 thesis that was done at Caltech. There's also a lot of great information in the more recent book, Vortical Flows by Wu Manju. That was in 2015. So here is one version of the impulse formulation for three-dimensional flows. And at a first glance, you might wonder how this is possibly an improvement over what is vastly more familiar in the standard analysis but we'll get to how this simplifies quite considerably. The actual impulse component of the impulse formulation is this integral here. This integral is typically referred to as vortical impulse or simply impulse, and it relates to the force through a time derivative analogous to momentum. Moving to our specific application of interest, a rotor, we define a control volume that is cylindrical, which is much larger in radius than the radius of the turbine so that on the lateral boundaries, we can assume the flow to be, with the velocity to be approximately that of the free stream. And the plane where we will do most of our analysis is SD. This is just behind the rotor. Looking specifically at the thrust component only, so taking the projection in the Z direction here in our cylindrical coordinate system, we can then simplify further making the assumptions of steady rotation, choosing to neglect the viscous terms for the time being, and assuming that the wake is rigidly rotating with the blades, that is that the vortical structure appears stationary from a frame of reference moving with the blades, then we're left only with these highlighted terms in the middle, the red velocity terms and these blue vortex terms. The first of these two is a flux term, so this is the flux of impulse leaving the domain, uh, the latter, I don't have a nice, tidy physical interpretation for you, but there is a sort of pleasing symmetry between those two terms. Simplifying that to express it in terms of the components of velocity and vorticity, as shown here, uh, and this is the thrust coefficient normalized in the conventional way by the swept area of the rotor. Uh, we have this expression here, and this derivation was all done, and even these images of the control volume are from, 
my recent work with Dr. David Wood at the University of Calgary, and that work is currently under peer review with Wind Energy Science. Now, we want to evaluate all of these parts of the force expression from stereo PIV data. The vorticity, we need to calculate gradients. We have the gradients necessary to calculate the axial component of vorticity, omega z. We have to approximate the in-plane azimuthal component, which we do by assuming, again, a rigidly rotating wake and invoking Taylor's frozen turbulence hypothesis. So we get this approximation, which we can try out. And it is can be evaluated with the information that we have. So this is resolvable with stereo PIV. Moving to the experimental setup, I have a whole setup here that is 3D printed, including the fuselage and the sting and the rotor itself. We have two cameras which are downstream of the rotor pointing inwards. This is a, the water channel facility at Princeton University. The cameras are facing normal to the acrylic walls to avoid optical distortion. And we have mirrors just inside the tunnel to redirect the line of sight to the plane of interest just behind the rotor. And of course we have the laser sheet, as you can see, lining up just behind the blades. We're actually driving the rotation, even though this is operating as a turbine, because the power that's being extracted from the flow is sufficiently small that it's quite a simple matter that it's being dissipated through the friction internal to the system. So the motor is mounted above the water line, connected to the rotor through internal shafts in this setup. And also above the water line is a force transducer. So we have a direct force measurement of the thrust acting on the turbine. And of course we will subtract the fuselage drag and the sting drag. And we'll compare that to the calculated forces using the PIV data. We've actually used uh, a polymer that is almost transparent for the hub and the blades. And this is to minimize any reflections of the laser sheet that is intersecting that plane just, be, just behind the, the blades. Of course, we still have issues of optical access. The fuselage is gonna block our view so that the cameras can only see sort of one sector beneath the fuselage at any one time. So what we've actually done is we have average fields over 200 rotations and we take 33, 30, sorry, 36 degree sectors and we're going to take 15 of those. So we have 12 degrees of overlap between them and we can stitch them together smoothly as is being shown by this, this video on the right. With a brief description of the results for one tip speed ratio and the same general patterns are observed for all of the tip speed ratios that we investigated. We have a region of accelerated flow ahead of the blade and a velocity deficit behind it, both of which are consistent with the expected sense of the blade's circulation. We also observe these interesting oscillations in the, in the flow field just actually ahead of the blades, and these are attributed to mechanical vibrations, which of course cannot be entirely eliminated. Looking at the azimuthal velocity, again we have clockwise rotation of the blades here, and we have the opposite direction. We have azimuthal velocity in the positive counterclockwise direction, just behind the blades, once again, consistent with the expected sense of the blade circulation. And we have regions of inwards and outwards radial velocity around the periphery of the, the swept disc. I won't describe any more details here. You can see the PowerPoint, which I will also upload, which shows for different tip speed ratios, how this pattern varies slightly from case to case. And now we can move on to the actual calculation of thrust. So we have three variants of the equation that I showed you before, which we are going to try to test. So the first is exactly what I showed you before. We will directly evaluate the vorticity and plug all that information in to this expression. The second equation, we're taking an alternative approach. So recall that omega theta, we had to make an approximation to estimate its value. So another way to get around that is to assume that vortex lines and streamlines are aligned in the frame of reference moving with the rotor. When we do that, we can relate omega z to omega theta and actually remove omega theta from 
the equation. And so we have an expression that only depends on the one component of vorticity. The last variant, equation three, is equivalent to equation two, so it incorporates that same physical assumption. We merely integrate equation two by parts and simplify in order to use directly the velocity information rather than needing to calculate vorticity because there's some possibility of numerical error due to the numerical estimation of the spatial gradients. And at long last, we have some, some force measurements. So this is the repeated trials to get the thrust curve. This is thrust coefficient versus tip speed ratio directly measured with the force transducer. So it's fairly repeatable. We have some small amount of scatter, but we have a nice clear trend. We have this clear mean thrust curve that is measured. Moving to equation one, calculated from PIV data, we roughly capture the trend, but we have a decrease in the magnitude. So we are under predicting the, the measured force, but more or less capturing the trend. Equation two does quite poorly as does equation three. Both of these incorporated the assumption of coincident vortex lines and streamlines. And this appears to be quite a poor assumption and increasingly poor as tip speed ratio increases. Now, despite the fact that they're mathematically equivalent or should be, uh, we have a difference in magnitude between the two, even though they capture the same trend. I had some thought that this might be due to the spatial resolution issue that I described before in the numerical calculation of vorticity. So I've tried reprocessing the data with finer resolution, so smaller PIV windows, and then I've done this only for one tip speed ratio, and recalculating the force. So this is shown with the orange stars on the plot, and we can see that this finer resolution has little impact, little impact actually on the estimated forces using the shown equations. So to sum up of where I'm at, this is very much a, a work in progress, but we can see that equation one is the most promising, predicting a reasonable trend, but under predicting the magnitude. So we'll be looking into things such as how blockage might be an issue. I'll need to quantify that uh, and looking at possible ways to, to actually correct for that. Uh, equation two and three do quite a poor job. So at this point, I'm concluding that the vortex lines and the streamlines being coincident is simply not a good approximation on this plane. As for spatial resolution, I might do a little more investigation into its effect, but this preliminary investigation that I've shown seems to show that the even the first resolution that I use is sufficiently resolved that any further improvements to resolution are not likely to resolve the discrepancies, at least not all of the discrepancies that we see. These are the references that I've directly referenced in this particular talk. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge that I personally have received an NSERC PDF grant for this work, and uh, NSF has also provided financial support through the grant number shown here. Of course, this is the point where I would ask you to take your questions. We're not live, obviously, but when then we're in the virtual meeting, I'd be happy to discuss and, and see what you think. Thank you very much. I can also make one last shameless plug. Uh, as I said, I am a postdoc, so I am looking for faculty positions. If this kind of work is something that might fit into your department, if you're looking for something of this sort, please let me know if your faculty is looking to hire. Thanks.